We're happy to have you with us. Efficiency Canada operates within Carleton University, and we acknowledge that the location of our campus sits on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. In doing so, we acknowledge that we have a responsibility to the Algonquin people and a responsibility to adhere to Algonquin cultural protocols. This workshop is hosted in partnership between Efficiency Canada and LC3, Low Carbon Cities Canada. Our Efficiency Canada staff is here to introduce our new guide on regulating energy and emissions in existing buildings, a primer for Canadian municipalities. I'll pass it to Shireen and Kevin. Thank you, Emily. Welcome to the, the third and final guide in this series. We've had workshops on the net zero energy ready codes, as well as the net zero emissions code. Both of those are aimed at set, setting an elevated performance standard for new construction. And that means that in terms of new construction, we have a path to reduce energy and emissions over the life of, the, of those buildings and one that will help ensure that those buildings are productive and long-standing assets over their life versus high emission liabilities. But new buildings are a relatively small market next to their existing building's counterpart, and that's where the AB really comes in. Now, under development, it's expected to guide energy efficiency improvements in Canada's approximately 16.5 million existing residential, commercial, and industrial buildings. Now, as I'm sure everyone here, to, here today is aware, uh, retrofits are challenging. They're disruptive for occupants. They can be complex and confusing to navigate and often require high upfront investment costs. But retrofits are also critical, particularly when we consider that nearly three quarters of the buildings standing today will still be in use in 2050. This means that each intervention is an opportunity to meet the demands of our growing population, but also ensure that, that the owners and occupants of those buildings have comfortable, healthy, and safe indoor environments. For municipalities, it's an opportunity to strengthen their existing energy systems, build resilience against things like extreme heat or other events or, or the smoke from wildfires that many of us are experiencing today, as well as protect building and homeowners against rising energy costs. However, as it stands, there's no harmonized approach currently in place to retrofitting our existing buildings. And instead, there's a patchwork of, of codes for new buildings that are applied to existing buildings. And these include the National Energy Code for Buildings, the National Building Code, ASHRAE standards, and others. These are used as a stand-in for a national retrofit code but they typically have no or few requirements to address emissions or if energy efficiency when applied to existing buildings, nor are they well suited to address the unique considerations of existing buildings. And as a result, code officials and code users have been forced to apply incomplete and difficult to understand code requirements to existing buildings. And this is what the AB is intended to resolve. It's meant to support a, a regulatory environment, building codes, as well as related standards, and align with Canada's climate objectives. So the AAB takes a building as a systems approach, and it recognizes a combination of materials, components, or assemblies that make up the building's systems. So for example, this could be the HVAC system, building envelope assemblies, or the air barrier system. And the AAB views each of these systems as interacting with one another, and really looks at how a change in one aspect of this dynamic system can disrupt the, the performance of another, or upset the, the performance of the building as a whole. It's triggered by renovation act, action that, that is taken at the owner's behest. And so really the owner is driving the re retrofit activity and then entering the, the path for code requirements. It applies only to the portion of the building that's being altered or any new additions to the existing building versus the whole building. It uses trigger points, which are on the screen, to help define the scope of retrofit activity. The AB is triggered by renovation action taken by the owner, the voluntary action taken by the owner. It applies to the portion of the building being altered or any new additions, but not the entire building. It uses trigger points, which I think is where we left off on the screen now to help define the scope of retrofit activity. And this helps determine whether or not specific retrofit activity warrants building code intervention and the extent of the technical requirements that will be applied. And they include things like the maintenance, repair, or replacement of a system or with a similar system or component, change of occupancy type, new additions, the reconfiguration of existing space, a systems upgrade, and other. And really the other is, is a catch-all for things that have yet to be identified. And so once triggered, renovation activity under the AB falls into one of three categories to determine if it falls within the AB or if it's exempt. Projects that maintain, repair, or replace an assembly or systems in a like-for-like -like manner, these can be expected to be exempt. And this is so long as the performance of the building is no worse than bef before the intervention took place. On the other hand, projects may be required to follow AEB provisions based on the building type, project size, and the complexity of the proposed project. 
And this is really based on the level of activity to help determine if they're minor or major alterations. So as an example, if a system's upgrade, a space reconfiguration, change of occupancy, or an addition is planned by the building owners, the scope of that project will determine if it's a minor or a major alteration. However, sorry, next slide, Emma. Reaching our climate co commitments, and namely our, our 25, 20, sorry, net zero by 2050 objective, will demand a, a marked increase in the pace and scale of how we retrofit our, our existing buildings. And the AB will have a fundamental role in this tr transition, and particularly for municipalities who will be acting in the role of authority having jurisdiction. It'll deliver a much needed regulatory backstop that will really help guide the, the expected increase in re retrofit activity in the coming years. It'll also provide a wide range of benefits for different groups. And so for owners and investors, it will provide a, certainty, a level of certainty for both performance and investments, which it can help de-risk. It'll provide a focus point for labor and help with education and training programs. For building owners and occupants, it helps define a standard of performance that could be sought at the time of building purchase or occupancy. Governments can easily reference the AB in, in law and regulatory processes. And for energy utilities, it will help provide a target for demand-side management programs that could help and encourage greater retrofit activity. And much like the tiered codes discussed in previous workshops and the, the net zero emissions code, the AB will foster a higher level of confidence in the market, largely through providing regulatory certainty. And despite these benefits, the AB is still limited in reach, however. There are limitations into how effective a, a retrofit code, not just the alterations to existing building code, but any retrofit code can be based on voluntary renovation work. And so the first limitation is in the trigger, trigger. In addition to the voluntary nature of the triggers, there's also a risk that bad actors could tailor or manipulate interventions to avoid triggering code requirements. The next uh, uh, obstacle would be the lower volume of activity triggered. Again, to, due to the voluntary triggers, only a small percentage of the existing building stock will be subject to the retrofit code. From there, even a smaller portion of each individual building is subject to A, B requirements. So again, it's only the portion that's being worked on rather than the entire building. Next up, sequencing. So in some cases, and, and really uh, particularly in the first years after the A, B is adopted by provinces and territories, adding additional requirements to a project might have the potential to, to, to trigger a cascade of additional costs that weren't expected by the building owner. There's also no provision within the AB to, to see each building on a path to net zero. This is something that we can advocate for in future years, but as of now, there's no mechanism for that yet. And also compliance. Compliance is always a challenge no matter what the, the building could, but in existing buildings, it will raise new challenges related to the scope of work. And for municipalities, how they interpret the AB's exemptions and concessions, as well as prepare building officials for greater activity, but also more complex activity. And then finally, emissions. So emissions won't be an immediate requirement for the AB. The AB is based off the 2020 model codes, which don't have an emissions requirement, as we've learned in, in past workshops, but it will be considered in after those requirements have been added to the 2025 codes. So again, we're, we're probably looking at 2027 for the early emissions measures. In summary, the AB has the potential to be an important lever in how Canadian provinces, territories, and municipalities regulate construction activity in existing buildings. But as I've laid out, it's unlikely to drive the energy emissions reductions needed to meet our climate commitments and objectives. And for this to happen, we'll need additional tools. And through our research, as we've found, uh, these additional tools are mandatory building performance. And I'll pass the mic to Shereen to outline their role. Thank you, Kevin. As mentioned in the previous section, it's very clear that even with the adoption of the AAB code, jurisdictions will still need additional tools to increase the demand flow for retrofit activity. Mandatory building performance standards are emerging as a leading policy option worldwide to improve the energy efficiency and to lower emissions from the worst performing buildings or specific building types. So we can think about commercial or maybe fam multifamily buildings. This policy promises to move our buildings towards our net zero climate goals while ensuring equity through social assistance and technical guidance. So over the past decade, we've seen a growth in the adoption of mandatory building performance standards. So we know a number of cities and states in the U.S., member states of the European Union, United Kingdom, Australia, Tokyo, and most recently the city of Vancouver has already 
adopted mandatory building performance standards. And this is really seen as a way to promote immediate action, but also to offer building owners the support and the flexibility needed to meet these really stringent targets. So to develop and implement building performance standards, jurisdictions really need to collect extensive but also accurate data from the existing buildings, but also to understand the perspective of their stakeholders. So building information can be collected from a variety of sources, but we tend to see jurisdictions use their benchmarking programs to collect whole building performance data. And this data is really used to determine which buildings should be covered in under the BPS program, as well as to estimate the potential energy savings and, and emissions reduction. Now, building information should be integrated with the perspective of individuals who are likely to be impacted by this policy. So engaging stakeholders early and often will be crucial in order to have maximum buy-in, but also to ensure that the program itself is equitable. So incorporating demographic data, socioeconomic and other market related data will be quite important, not just to understand the short-term impacts of this policy, but also to understand what can happen in the long term. So there are like six main components of an effective BPS program. I'm not going to go into the details of each of these components simply because it's in the report. And I do encourage everyone to really dig into the, to the report. But just generally speaking, jurisdictions will need to make a decision about all of these elements. So they need to determine what building should be covered under the BPS program. What should be the metric? Should, is the BPS program going to be focusing on emissions or energy? What should be the standard? What is the target that we're aiming for? And that is really driven from your benchmarking data. And because BPS programs offer flexibility, there should be a variety of parts that um, building owners can use to actually comply with the program. And since we're really this, the, this, the, BPS program is, has really stringent targets, we need to also provide, or jurisdictions need to provide supportive programs in way of both technical and financial supports. And on the flip side, because we want to discourage non-compliance, it's important to also have penalties. So today I'll be focusing mostly on the rollout of the BPS program and what it entails, because I think typically this is where most people tend to be a little bit confused. So prior to the actual implementation of the BPS program, jurisdictions are really involved in policy design, and this involves really doing the due diligence, so reviewing the experience of comparable jurisdictions, really consulting and co-designing this program with jurisdictions, figuring out what is the appropriate approach that should be used given the unique circumstances of the jurisdictions. If a bench, benchmarking programs are not in place, this will be the time when these programs will need to be designed and implemented, all of the problem solving related to that as well as to do, this is where we would also set future targets. So I just want everyone to know that that phase actually takes anywhere between two to 10 years. So it's super important if jurisdictions think that this is BPS is what they want to pursue. There are a number of steps they can take right now to prepare for the future implementation of this policy. Now, once the performance standards comes into effect, building owners typically have a four to six year window to comply with the targets. And in some programs, we've seen that the interim targets are fixed from the start, or in other cases, it's recalculated at the end of each cycle. Now, that is really up to the jurisdiction, but it, it also just the jurisdiction should be aware that it really adds uncertainty for building owners. It's really recommended to go with more fixed interim targets. So during this four to six window, what we're expecting is that building owners will understand undergo retrofit activities, implement projects, try to optimize their buildings, as well as to submit benchmarking data annually. At the end of these cycles, this is where jurisdictions will need to determine whether or not the building was compliant or not. If it's compliant, then the building, you know, they're free to go on and, and to into the next cycle. If it isn't, then this is where the penalties will apply. And penalties doesn't necessarily have to be financial. There can be other types of penalties just to increase inconvenience for permitting and like a range of other things that can be used. So by the end of the cycle, and really this, the length of these cycles, we know it's four to six years, but we anticipate that there'll be a number of cycles before we can actually get to the final target. And these final targets really is linked to your large scale climate objectives. So typically what we see right now is that programs with a 2030 
final target tend to focus mostly on energy. Those with a 2050 target tend to include our emissions focus as well. So by that point, it is expected that building owners would have learned from this experience and that they would be the buildings would be performing at a high level and they're simply maintaining that standard. So I know that was very a short burst of information, but in conclusion, I really like this quote from the American Cities Climate Challenge. It really summarizes some of the key concepts that I touched on today. I want to say that the BPS policy will not be an easy, it's not an easy fix, but it leverages the actions that we're already taking. We have a number of funds, programs that the utilities are doing, programs that jurisdictions are doing. But the aim here is that we want to bring these sums and funding and financing under one umbrella, under one program, which is the BPS program. And I think municipalities are really idly positioned to leverage these resources, but we want to make sure that while we're focusing on energy and emissions, we also need to make sure that this, there aren't any negative social effects. It's very important to engage with those stakeholders and make sure that we carry them along and we address the issues that they are highlighting. So really, in conclusion, the time to act really was yesterday, but today is just as good.